Finally, it's spring. Plants are beginning to sprout, and the bugs are resuming their busy little lives. As always, winter has gone on for way too long, especially this winter. Or maybe it's just that 2020 has gone on for too long. It's just one thing after another. So, anyways, it's time to crawl out of my little quarantine nest and wander around the woods to look at some actual living things. Get some serotonin flowing before I die to the plague. I'm going to take a look a little further out into the woods, away from pestilence and people, to see what we can find. The trees are still a ways from leafing out right now. We had snow not too long ago, so they're still playing it safe. This creates a unique situation on the forest floor. The ground, which is normally shrouded by broad leaves during the growing season, finds itself exposed, and sunny, and warm. Enter the spring ephemerals. Now it's the magical time of year where some incredibly short-lived flowers are on display, taking full advantage of these conditions. Little bursts of color are smattered across the florist floor. Beautiful violets. Spring beauties. Hepatica. And some other fun little things. These flowers appear for only a short while in early spring. They flower quickly, set seed, and then sit on the back burner for the rest of the season which makes for quite the exclusive show. Here's one of the daintiest little pink things out there, the spring beauty. Probably called that because it flowers in the spring, and it's subjectively a beauty. After getting to know them during my last trip in the woods, I can say they're one of my favorite flowers. They're just so friendly looking. They're pretty fun little flowers. They come in the standard colors of pink and white, and rarely yellow. The yellow variety is isolated to a small area in New Jersey, so most people will probably never see those. Identification is pretty easy. The flowers have five petals, with nice pink veins running lengthwise down the petals. On the other side, there are two sepals that cup the back of the flower. I did find one abomination of a flower, with the incorrect number of petals, which was pretty cool. Just something to look out for. Something interesting you might find on these is the pathogen called Spring Beauty Rust, Puxinia Mariae Wilsoniae. It was first collected near Buffalo, New York, and is named after Mary Wilson, a naturalist from the area. Being from Buffalo myself, I was kind of surprised to find that out, and I guess I felt a little obligated to point it out. I thought the only major discovery here was chicken wings. I mean, they're both orange, so maybe we're onto something. Around here, there are two species. Claytonia caroliniana and Claytonia virginica. The only noticeable difference is the leaf shape, with Claytonia virginica having much narrower leaves. The ones I'm looking at today are Claytonia caroliniana for the most part. They have just a little bit rounder leaves. Apparently, another name for these flowers is the fairy spud. Now, believe me, I have talked about flowers with other human people before, and I have never heard anyone call them that. Usually, they're either called Claytonia, Spring Beauty, or those little pink flowers that come out in the spring. Maybe other people have had different experiences, or maybe it's some sort of regional thing, but never Fairy Spud. But the name Fairy Spud does kind of make sense when you think about it. Spring Beauty plants produce small edible tubers underground. They're pretty small, though. The ones that I dug up are small and flattish, somewhat like a lobed lentil or something. I feel bad harvesting fairy spuds for myself, since it takes quite a bit of time to gather anything worth a meal. There are plenty of other roots out there that feel a lot less destructive to harvest. With most woodland wildflowers, harvesting in moderation is key. Except for the invasives, of course. Mess those guys up. Fairy spuds are actually not the easiest thing to dig, either. The stems leading to the tubers are quite slender and prone to breaking, so you might have to pick through the soil to find all the lost tubers. On the plus side, the soil is nice and loose here, and rich from years of decomposing organic matter. The ultimate no-till garden. So maybe all of this is a fairy farm. It's actually more likely to be an ant farm. These are likely cultivated unintentionally by ants, but maybe the ants work for the fairies? I always kind of thought of insects like tiny biological robots, just beep pooping around in their little niches. Anyways, if I was a fairy, I would absolutely farm the shit out of spring beauty, serve up a little side of Claytonia fries, make some mini baked potatoes, 
or maybe serve up a tiny platter complete with flowers of its sister plant, the trout lily. Both plants are actually edible, from the flowers and leaves to the fairy spuds themselves. The flowers of the trout lily are actually quite uncommon despite being so widespread in the woods. You can barely walk a foot without stepping on trout lily leaves, yet the flowers are few and far between. Let's take a look a little bit closer. The flowers have six petals and six stamens, which is a good hint that they're part of the lily family. So these are the leaves of the trout lily. They get their name from the mottled pattern on their simple elliptic leaves. It's supposed to resemble the modeling on a brook trout, but I'm not much of a fish guy, so I had to look that up. I have, however, caught my fair share of tiger trout in Stardew Valley, and they do have a bit of a mottled pattern. So yeah, I would say that that looks like a trout. Some of the leaves only have slight mottling and are mostly green, but then others can be very, very purpley. But back to what I was saying earlier. If you look around the forest floor, it's absolutely littered in colonies of trout lily leaves. But where are all the flowers? There's barely any here. That's because each lily takes from four to seven years to flower. That's a long ass time to make a little flower. But it makes sense. They can only photosynthesize effectively in early spring. Each year they only get a fraction of the growing season to be actively storing energy, so it's going to take a while to mature. With that in mind, it's not too surprising that typically less than half of a percent of trout lily plants in a colony will be flowering. So, like I said earlier, you can eat trout lilies, although I think it might be best not to. If you have to, the whole thing is edible. Underground, there are even tiny little corms which you can snack on, but I wouldn't be too aggressive in harvesting these. Another fun fact is that trout lilies suck at sexual reproduction. They tend to set very few seeds after being pollinated, but when they do, they get some extra help with dispersal and planting. They evolve specialized structures attached to the seed, known as eliosomes, which are fleshy, fat, and protein-rich structures. Eliosomes mimic nutrient-dense animal tissue to attract ants, which carry seeds away to be cleaned and planted. Trout lilies aren't the only ones doing this, though. The same seed dispersal method is being used by the violet, who's also flowering at the same time. And don't even get me started about violets. So, it makes sense that violets are called violets since they're violet, just like how oranges are orange. But what if I told you that some violets aren't violet, but liars? Like, come on, what's this? It's a yellow violet? This is a violet violet, and this, this isn't even violet. Like, this one has the faintest trace of violet, but really? I don't know which came first, violet or violet. Violets are actually quite pretty, once you get past them not being all violet. They're among the most delicate and beautiful spring wildflowers, and they also lend themselves really nicely to gardening. Some violets can establish nice bushy clumps that flower not only in the beginning of spring, but deep into summer, provided ideal conditions. But as you know, being beautiful won't save you from being chewed up and eaten in this cruel world. As is the case with many of my favorite plants, the violet is edible in many different ways. The flowers can be picked and added to salads to brighten things up a little bit. They can also be candied and eaten with desserts, or made into a syrup with a slight violety aroma. The leaves can be eaten in salads or as a cooked green. They're decent enough on their own, or really good mixed with some other wild edibles. And they're definitely easier to collect than the flowers. I don't feel as bad eating these since they do last a bit longer through the summer, and they're way more vigorous than any of the other true spring ephemerals. Violets reproduce quite aggressively over here, tearing through moist shady areas like it's nobody's business. Unlike the dainty trout lily, violets tend to seed quite well. They even make cleistogamous flowers, or flowers that never even open to be cross-pollinated. So they just go and make like me during quarantine and take care of business themselves. That's a handy trick to have. Well, making do on your own can work perfectly well. Violets also have a tendency to outcross and hybridize with everyone in town. There are quite a few different native species here, as well as hybrids between said species. So, exact species level ID can be kind of a chore if you're not absolutely enamored with the genus. I dabble, but there's no way I'm diving that deep right now. 
I could probably do a whole separate video if I can find the willpower to differentiate them all. So for the moment, that's yellow violet, these ones are violet violets, and these ones can go ID themselves. Voila. Or viola, rather. Here we have some hepatica. To me, it sounds more like a font than a flower, but that doesn't really matter. You'll find all sorts of variations of the scientific names for this, being switched around from the genus anemone to hepatica. Common names for these flowers include hepatica, liverwort, or liverleaf. These are pretty dainty little flowers, ranging from pale blue to purple in color. A few of the leaves at this time of year can look a little bit maroonish, leathery, and beat up. These leaves actually overwinter to take advantage of every drop of early springtime sunshine. If you look a little closer, there are small silvery hairs along the stems and leaves, which is an adaptation to the cold. The hairs help to trap a little bit of heat when the plants need it most to get that competitive edge. The three-lobed leaves supposedly resemble livers, if you look at them the right way, which leads to this little fun fact. There's an idea known as the Doctrine of Signatures, which reasons that medicinal herbs look like the parts of the human body that they're meant to treat. Some people reason that God would have left signs to show mankind that certain plants can be used for healing. So hepatica, resembling the liver, used to be used quite extensively as a treatment for liver problems. Now unfortunately, God is dead, and plants don't work like that. Hepatica, along with many other supposedly medicinal plants, do not function medicinally as intended when following the doctrine of signatures. I'm not saying that any plant can't be used medicinally, but just that this one doesn't really pan out. What hepatica does do is make nice little flowers really early in the springtime. It's okay if you can't use a plant for anything, and if all you do is just look at it. That's probably better for both you and the plant, too. Well, I think it's time I pack up and skedaddle. There are tons of other plants, mushrooms, and other things that'll be coming out this spring, and hopefully I'll be able to show you some more soon. To whoever finds this out there in the depths of the internet, thanks for watching. And if you want to take a look at anything else I've made, I would really appreciate it. Stay safe out there, and be careful as always. I love you. Bye. Hello?